All right, I think we'll get started. So first of all, thanks everyone for joining. Um, you're seeing me in the room that I broadcast from. As we all know, we're probably all in some very interesting places. Oh, <laughs> the big reveal, we've got Ari wearing a suit. So I love it. Uh, so anyway. How, how do you work from home, Paul? I mean, I think that it's appropriate to dress properly for work. So Ari's my boss, um, and this is very <laughs> awkward for me right now. But anyway, I'm going to deflect that and uh, start to introduce the panel. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their day and joining. Um, you know, we're in a we're in a difficult period. Uh, best we can do is all stick together and be in weird weird places on Zoom, wearing uh, wearing corporate approved gear and uh, <clears throat> trying to you know talk to each other and, and uh, reach the screen as much as we can uh, to connect and see how we're all dealing with this. So just a couple of housekeeping things. This is a Zoom webinar. Uh, this is somewhat new to us, the whole virtual panel setup. So uh, the usual stuff works, the Q and A works, the chat works. We may get a little bit crazy and even try to do the, the weird hand raise thing. If somebody wants to ask a question and actually like go on camera, I think that might be cool. Might also fall flat on its face and make us look stupid. So. We'll give it a shot. Um, but anyway, I want to get us rolling. I'm going to introduce our very dapper host, um, Ari Paparo. He's the co-founder and CEO of Beeswax. Uh, he's a recognized product leader in ad tech and SaaS. He was, you know, you know him from DoubleClick, you know him from Google, you know him from FNexus uh, and from uh, Nielsen. And uh, he tweets quite a bit on Twitter. So if you follow him on Twitter, you, you know about that stuff, but he's going to be our host. So I'm going to go turn off my lovely video and turn it over to Ari. You'll, you'll hear from me at the end because I'm going to moderate the Q&A and see if we can make this hand wave thing work. Um, also, there, right. will be, there, there will be downloadable survey results at the end of this. So uh, I'll, without any further ado, Ari, I'll let you take it from here. All right, thanks, Paul. Um, so um, I'll have you know that uh, while I dress formally from the waist up, I'm not wearing pants. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, so I appreciate we have 430 people joining this webinar, which is incredible. I, I imagine a lot of folks stuck at home looking for anything to do during the day. Um, we're in, at BSX, we're in the same position a lot of you are, working from home, trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, we decided one thing we could do was uh, try to help um, the community in ad tech get a better bearing on what's going on. So uh, today we'll, um, we'll go through some survey results of a survey we did yes, uh, last week. And then we have two amazing panelists who come at this from different perspectives. So I'll ask the panelists to uh, introduce themselves and uh, talk about kind of, you know, in a couple of sentences, what's going on in your business in, in these uh, crazy times. So uh, let's start with uh, Anna Milicevic. Sorry about that. I, I knew I was going to mess that up. <laughs> a, also a frequent tweeter um, and the co-founder of Spiral Advisors. Yeah, I just go by Anna because like Madonna, because apparently I have an unpronounceable last name. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm as shocked as you are to see uh, Ari in a, in a top suit and tie, I guess. Uh, I'm the co-founder and principal of Sparrow Advisors. We're a management consultancy that focuses on ad tech, martech and adjacent industries. And we work with uh, brands, technology companies, uh, investors, and just about everybody else on the uh, marketplace who's looking to figure out how to embrace ad tech and martech and do better with, uh, with their uh, advertising and marketing efforts. Um, and Dom, Dom Joseph, the co-founder and CEO of Captify. Dom's coming to us from rural England where he actually has the plague. Uh, and it's in between uh, ICU visits to, to be with us. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think of it as the plague, I suppose, but uh, no, I, uh, I, I've, I've had the symptoms for, or some symptoms anyway, for the last 12 days. So I've been, uh, I've been hiding down in the countryside, staying well away from anybody. Um, but, you know, life goes on. This is the reality of it. So, uh, but yeah, thanks for having me, Ari. I'm, I'm Dom from Captify. We are a uh, business that specializes in search data and search intelligence. Um, we are uh, right now uh, being from London, which, which is on lockdown and, and, and having many different European clients. We're right in the middle of this COVID situation, which is hugely impacting our industry and all of our clients and everybody around us. So uh, it's been a hell of a two weeks to get to grips with. Um, well, thanks again for uh, both of you joining. We have a good mix of ad tech, martech, brand, and media uh, backgrounds between the three of us. So let's just dive in. So the first topic we're going to talk about is our survey results. Um, and the panelists also hopefully will have a good discussion about what we see there. 
Um, so um, we did a survey last week, not super scientific, but we have a pretty good mailing list of, you know, thousands of professionals in our industry. Um, and we asked for a 10 question anonymous survey. Uh, we got 123 respondents. Um, and uh, I'm going to walk through what we heard from them. Um, in some cases, we're uh, going to show just folks who said they were ad tech companies and what they said versus all of the respondents. Um, and we're going to make these results available um, after, after the panel. So, um, so first of all, in terms of who the panelists are, um, about half, or excuse me, 43% ad tech, um, another quarter rounded numbers agency, publisher, and then a mix of folks. So that kind of gives you a little sense of who was answering the questions. So pretty heavy buy side, I would say overall. Um, all right, so, and who were the respondents in terms of level? Um, mostly uh, executive, because of course an executive or VP, so it's pretty senior point of view in terms of who responded of the 123 respondents. Okay, so now to the meat of it. Um, so um, how is Q2 trending? So we're about to enter Q2. I think Q1, you know, a lot of people are seeing some flatness, but Q2 is kind of the big question. Um, and, um, and you could see of the, of the questions we, a we asked, um, and this is just for ad tech, the ad tech respondents, 37% uh, saw a drop of 25% or more in Q2 in terms of spend. Uh, and then another 30% saw a drop of up to 25%. Um, so I think pretty strong consensus that Q2 is going to be down um, on the spend level. Um, if not, in, you know, based on your business model, that probably correlates to revenue as well. 18% uh, saw it increasing. Oh, that's good. Good for them. <laughs> um, I, I and then wonder the, who those 18% are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The, Was uh, this an anonymous you know, survey? <laughs> Can we do anonymous? <laughs> <laughs> VirusTreatmentNetworks.net. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, this is the same question just with everyone, including the agencies and publishers. Um, and it's even more so. Uh, so it's a little more extreme in that um, uh, the larger proportion showing some sort of drop. Um, so this is, I don't think it's super surprising. Um, I think it'd be a miracle personally. I think it'd be a miracle if Q2 wasn't down on spend. Either, if anyone care to disagree, you see some upside no, in Q2. I think the only thing that's really hard to predict now is uh, down by how much, because right. what we're seeing in market is that you know, everybody's natural reaction in, in times of uncertainty is to kind of batten the hatches and hit pause if possible and kind of see what happens. So that's kind of the, the uh, feedback that we're getting for, from folks on the marketer side as well. Like, yeah, you know, we, we obviously don't want to be very aggressively advertising right now and, and going after the, the same old, same old stuff that we were running just a few weeks ago, but we also don't really have a bulletproof plan or really any kind of playbook to what to shift to. So it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of expectation going on. And I think it really depends on which vertical you're in. Obviously, if you're in something like travel and hospitality, the last thing you're thinking about right now is customer acquisition. Yep. And one thing on that subject, it's a little off, off topic, but it's interesting is I wonder what's going to happen to the summer vacation season. If, uh, it, imagine we're back to normal, as they call it, by the summer, but no one has planned any vacations and people are still gun shy and the travel industry is really, um, could, it could have effects well beyond uh, the timeline on, you know, quarantine. Yes. It's worth, uh, it's worth also having, uh, having a think about lockdown. Um, what we've seen is a different, uh, a different rate to a different, different set of behaviors from when countries go into lockdown. Um, and we certainly saw that in Paris. Paris is a very uh, a good territory for us and we have many clients running there. As soon as it went into actual lockdown, which was last week, just over a week ago, um, everyone actually paused completely and stopped. Mm. Um, and we just had a lockdown two days ago here in the UK. So we'll, uh, we haven't seen quite the same dramatic reaction, um, but I'm, I'm definitely concerned about the US over the next couple of weeks because that, that, that curve is is aggressively going up at the minute and uh, uh, we'll see what happens with the different different levels of lockdown. Yeah, we had actually, the, we've seen the same thing in Beeswax. So Europe, especially France, uh, was the first place where we started hearing from customers that were cutting spend. Uh, US has not been very dramatic except for sectors like travel. Um, so uh, I don't know if the other shoe is going to drop in the US or if there's something fundamentally different about the 
uh, advertising approach here. Um, and, and there is some evidence, and I think uh, we'll talk about this later, but there are some sectors that are doing well, like CPG. Uh, I think the Wall Street Journal today reported that Campbell's Soup um, is seeing like 50% increases in sales. Um, people want the canned soup for the apocalypse, et cetera. Um, let me move on to Q. I think we have a Q3 slide next. I, I'm see, I see people are um, adding questions to Q&A. Keep doing that. Uh, we're not going to answer the questions until the end, but it's fine to keep on asking them. We'll, we'll go through them at the end. Um, okay, so Q3, and this is ad tech only. Um, can't tell too early, 50%. Yeah, that's pretty honest. I'm glad people are, are, uh, are ready to say they don't know anything. Um, back to normal, 25%. I'm voting for that. Uh, that would be fantastic. Better than normal, 15%. So pretty optimistic set of uh, responses here on Q3. Um, the, and then the same question to the broader group. The broader group knows even less than the ad tech group. <laughs> so 58%, no idea. Um, I think I think it's, it's kind of important though, isn't it? This this sort of lack of n knowing, mm -hmm. it, it kind of means that everybody's financial forecasting that needs to happen now needs to be doubly thought Oops, through because is is the, the financial forecasting needs to be doubly thought through because you can you can make cuts and you can prepare for a bad Q2, but with such an unknown in Q3, if you have the same thing happen again or worse you know, you, your business could be in real trouble. So I think that's, that's the thing that everybody's really got to get their heads into at the moment. Yeah, exactly. There, there's also it, the, sorry, Ari, there's also the, the chance to divert what you would normally spend on uh, cu new customer acquisition and reactivation or advertising in general on other kinds of efforts and sort of, you know, whenever uncertainty like this hits, it's a good time to kind of look inward and see what are some of the things that you might want to change up and kind of tackle all of those projects that you've been postponing, like analyzing, you know, who you're using as partners, seeing if there are any efficiencies to be gained coming out of this by maybe not, you know, leveraging 12 technology partners, but cutting that down to eight or nine or whatever is the kind of the minimum viable solution for you. But also as marketers, you know, putting money directly in your customers' hands, in your partners' hands, that should be on the table because these budgets have already been approved and are already in the books, at least for Q2. So I, I hope that folks Certainly in, in smaller businesses, if they are somewhat uh, above water right now, these are the conversations that are happening. But I, I hope that this is happening at the larger brands as well. And we've seen some indication that that's exactly what's going on. From so Anna, do you, think, do you think marketers are going to have more bandwidth over the next four or five months to try new things? Like one theory I've heard from other CEOs is that um, if you're not advertising, if you're pulling back all over the place, you have some qualified people who otherwise might not take your meeting who might be available to start trying new things or experimenting with stuff. Yeah, I, I think that's the right, uh, right thing to do in general. And mm -hmm. that's certainly what we're advising most of our clients. You, you can't just sit and wait. And the, the easiest way to, to do something productive is to think about something new. And in many ways, because we're all experiencing this crisis at the same time, it's a little bit of a unifying uh, uh, event to your point. The, this this kind of gives you that, hey, we've been talking about this concept or we've been meaning to try this, we haven't. It's kind of, you know, now's the time. What else are we gonna do when we're all stuck on Zoom calls? and uh, and trying our best to figure out new approaches. So I, I think uh, I, I tend to, to look at this rather optimistically and hope that we'll come out of this crisis on the other end, hopefully reasonably soon with you know new, new energy, new approaches, new things. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're thinking about, let's say 2021 in-housing, this summer would be a great time to get a lot of groundwork done because you don't, you're not running as much media, there's less overhead yeah. day to day. Exactly. Um, it's like, I've got one <laughs> campaign. <laughs> Let me build a team to run my one campaign. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, so, um, so we asked, are, are you seeing any vertical strength? Um, mm -hmm. And 44% um, of folks said, yes, they're seeing some vertical strength. Um, but more interestingly, where are they seeing it? So this was a, like a free form answer. So they didn't aggregate it. Uh, but I think there's some interesting um, nuggets here. Uh, food and grocery. So I mentioned earlier, um, supermarkets are all up, CPGs up, people are buying buying stuff. 
um, home delivery, hand sanitizer, whoever's got the hand sanitizer account, who, who's the agency of record for Purell? <laughs> <laughs> They're doing great. Um, any surprises here or any things that, uh, that you're also seeing? I think political spend obviously uh, this year I mean, is going to continue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I'm somewhat surprised to see retail here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, let's let's unpack that uh, in particular because this was the year when we were looking at political spend as a huge influx here in the U.S. in particular around our elections and uh, also Olympics spend and yep. Uh, yep. the elections are still happening hopefully and hopefully. Uh, the Olympics are are not right. <laughs> so so what happens to those budgets? which are uh, likely sizable and, and large uh, sponsorships attached particularly to the, the Olympics. And so if you're a brand that has uh, that kind of cash that was going to be committed to those kinds of efforts, like where do you, where do you divert yeah. that right away? The big, the, the big sports brands, um, you know, there was, a, yeah. there was a hell of a lot being committed this year. You had the, Europe, you had the Euro, Euros uh, football, you had all of the always on sports that's going on in every country. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, the Olympics and uh, all these major brands are going to be looking to redeploy that 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 uh, advertising spend. And one thing that we've seen so far as an early indicator is the huge rise in um, in esports. Mm -hmm. uh, and esports is going to is going to do very well from this. And yeah, uh, as uh, as as people want to watch competitive live streaming of gaming and uh, and sports esports play. So that's a that's a really perfect example because if you look at someone like Formula One, who I would say is a you know global tier one sport, how quickly they jumped on the the transition from having physical races canceled to actually having an esports replay of the same yeah. race with drivers who are from from the actual sport like that was really really exciting and I think it's going to accelerate uh, a lot of the adoption of of esports. Also, because yeah. we don't have actual sports, <laughs> how are we calling? Is it sports and esports, or, meat, <laughs> or I like, think you're calling them meat sports. Meat, meat sports, okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to compete in bacon. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the only surprise here for me on this slide, just to 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 uh, take meat sports rabbit hole, uh, is uh, retail. Yeah, uh, I, I'm. I'm I would think that maybe that's going towards informing customers about, uh, you know, uh, order online, pick up in store or delivery kinds of options. But uh, that, yeah. that seems, otherwise it seems uh, dubious. That could definitely be a misclassification since it was a free, free forum entry. It could have been, they could have meant mm -hmm. e-commerce or something like that. Cause we, we certainly thought retail is a very bad category among yeah. our customers. Um, gaming and online gaming being strong. Um, there's nothing to stop people from installing another, you know, another solitaire app, another, you know, gambling app, whatever it is, um, stuck in the house. Um, so I think those things we've seen is pretty strong. Um, the uh, obviously travel, not so much, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, Okay, so then we asked like, what are you doing about it? Well, I think we only have like two, two more slides or something like that. Um, so what strategies has your company deployed um, so far? Um, and this is for all respondents. Um, so uh, some form of reducing spend on tech and third party services, um, not doing nothing, 30%, 30 respondents, 18%. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> um, lowering prices, reducing expenses, other um, the um, and uh, switching the lower cost alternatives. Um, so I think the interesting point in this is the green green bar, and I think Anna, you mentioned this a little bit, which is um, you know what is what's a medicine and what's a vitamin? I guess is the old venture capitalist thing to say. Like you can do without your vitamins, you need your medicines. Um, what what do you what do you, would you do if you were an agency or an advertiser to like for the short term pain? I think, you know, the other and none together are, are very interesting because uh, th they could very well be showing you the same thing. Um, sure. I think on the, if, if I'm an agency right now, my number one priority is to 
uh, kind of make sure that my staff understands the shift to work from home, that I'm over communicating, that these are very challenging times and that I'm encouraging my staff to surface ideas that are perhaps outside of the usual box of, um, mm -hmm. you know, advertising, but that they've been gearing, gunning to try. And I, I think this is an effective use of, of kind of creativity under lockdown. That's something that can really benefit uh, the end client. And I, I would imagine that's exactly what marketers are doing. As soon as they're done with, you know, plugging the holes uh, of, uh, you know, what's, what's currently most in, in crisis and getting set up, and work from home environments, which for you know several of our clients was a was an interesting hurdle just to to migrate the entire company into into a remote first environment. Um, I, I think that's the the next step for them is to to rethink uh, what they could be doing in the span of uh, like two three four week increments, no more than that, because the situation is is shifting so much that we can't really plan beyond that. Uh, another really interesting thing we've seen is that uh, it really depends geographically where mm -hmm. you are, uh, how you're approaching treating this. So in some countries that are ahead of where the US is when it comes to the pandemic, things have uh, you know, become a little bit less about running around with your hair on fire and, and folks are you know, executing backup plans. And I, I think in the US we're still on the, the early stages and, and really to gauge impact other than to kind of tell everybody not to panic, but that's not a very, um, very, very effective yeah. way of, of handling people panicking. And Dom, um, what about you? Like both for your business and for your customers, what are you seeing people ask for? Well, I think the first thing that we've had to do as a business is try and understand what, you know, what the forecast looks like and try and get a realistic forecast, which is incredibly difficult at the minute. Um, because, you know, I, you know, if you, if you asked, if you do this survey again in a week's time, some of those, uh, some of those sectors might be quite, quite different. Um, mm. Because I think there's going to be quite a range of, uh, of reactions of how uh, brands pause, pause spends. You know, we've just seen today Coca-Cola have just paused all marketing spend um, you know, that, that, that wasn't the case just, you know, yesterday. So, uh, uh, I think we've all got to be super wary of that. And I think companies have got to, have got to think twice about this forecast with, with a view that the next quarter as well is very uncertain. I think there's a massive issue about cash. Uh, maybe not so much your business, Ari, but the, uh, ad, ad tech typically, ad tech typically sits quite far down the chain in the, uh, payments in the, the payment right. chain. And uh, we're going to see a horrible drop off of payments coming through. There's going to be people who left, right and center aren't paying. This is going to put mm -hmm. tremendous strain on the banks um, and the lending facilities that everybody's got. Um, a lot of the companies in our industry that aren't profitable are going to struggle to even get the loans to support them. So I think that uh, companies who aren't profitable are going to really have a tough time here. So, yeah. um, and that's quite interesting for ad tech because ad tech has always been growth, growth, growth. You know, so that actually might, this, this period of time that goes off the next couple of quarters where everybody rethinks their strategies to do with profit, profitability over, over growth is going to have a longer term effect on innovation in the, in the sector. And um, we've also got to, you know, companies have really got to think about not just the now, like the short term saving of their business and making sure that they're coming out structurally in a good place with levers to be able to invest on certain things as you exceed your numbers. Uh, I think we've also got to think about the challenges on the horizon for the industry in two years time. A lot of, a lot of investment was going into solutions post the, uh, the, the, the cookie changes that are happening with the Google Chrome update in two years time. And uh, now you've got this huge distraction that's going to go on with everybody this year as everybody really gets their you know, battles with really just business as usual. So uh, there's a lot to think about there. Yeah, I mean, the, the best thing about this whole crisis is that no one's asked me about cookies in three weeks. Um, you know, <laughs> we've talked about it's a change of topic. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's, it, let's talk about payment terms for one second because that's my favorite, one of my favorite topics. Um, so what I've seen happen is that last year you had a couple of high profile flame outs, um, you know, Seismic and Ignition One and folks um, and publishers got clawed back by some exchanges. And then there was this big, there was this big counter reaction already happening where publishers were telling their exchanges, um, you have to guarantee payments. I want, I want you to be harsher on the DSPs. 
So we've seen from the sell side coming into beeswax as a DSP, all kinds of like, um, you know, requests for information, insurance, et cetera, et cetera, where they want to insure our payments. So now what's going to happen in this crisis is that as a DSP, we're going to get paid slower by agencies and advertisers. We're going to want to pay the exchanges slower, but they're going to get pushed by the publishers on the other side. And it's a question of, you know, who gets squeezed, the DSP, SSP, or the publisher in the end. I mean, everybody I think, gets squeezed, and, and I think everybody's going to be trying to, to renegotiate payment terms as, as, as much as possible right now, which mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, you know, part of the, the challenge. But again, with this crisis affecting everybody, like, it's not overwhelmingly affecting just the buy side. So we, we have uh, a, a license to try to negotiate in good faith. And I can't believe I just said that in the ad tech context, but sure. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, because if, if companies start going under because of aggressive payment terms, that's not going to be good for anybody in the long term. So if, if we don't understand that kind of interdependency in regular society, hopefully we can understand it on the business side because mm -hmm. it's really not going to serve anybody if all of a sudden a, a DSP or an SSP, you know, a, a big DSP or D, the SSP goes under, what are we going to do then? Yeah. Right. Uh, exactly. and, and, yeah. And, and, and that is definitely going to happen. There's no yeah. way that's oh, going to happen. Definitely. I know. A big, uh, uh, one of the big guys, or going under and not m making payments would just be horrendous. Um, let's, well, let's hope that, let's hope that does not happen. Paradoxically, but as, as everyone uh, who's probably tuned in knows, uh, any type of uh, big disruption really ends up benefiting the top three. Mm -hmm. So uh, somewhat ironically, they're the only ones that can afford to, you know, have changes to payment terms and have that be relatively, uh, have, have it have a relatively small effect on, on their overall business operations. Mm -hmm. But if folks start going under, that spend is when it resuscitates itself is still going to have to go somewhere and guess where it's going to go. So <laughs> uh, while we're on the topic of the big guys, um, what's the effect on Facebook and Google short term and long term? Um, I think, I'll, I'll start, which is, I think they're going to see spend decline very, very rapidly because of their base of so many small and mid-sized businesses that will shut it off um, aggressively. Um, in the, but, the, but in my mind, there's an open question, does this in the longer term help accelerate consolidation and make them more of a, a, a flight to quality when everything comes back or not? Any thoughts yeah, on that? I, I think definitely because, uh, they're, they're the easiest to shut off, but then they have so many individual advertisers in from the smallest category to the largest that while they'll see an overall impact, it's not like you know all of their advertisers are going to go away. Like for mm -hmm. someone like uh, Yelp or uh, Yext or similar, who's you know working with very local, smaller, small-ish businesses who are currently in suspended animation and some may not emerge. So uh, I, I think long term, uh, it's much, much easier to buy on the top three. So if I'm thinking about having a limited budget, uh, I'm going to be diverting that into an environment where I know users hang out and that's most likely going to be one of the top three and mm -hmm. where I can have some basic friction and brand safety and similar concepts, which again, looking at the open internet might not be seven uh, uh, at the moment. And you know, if I want to block certain keywords like anything that's related, but I still want to advertise on news sites, like that's a really sort of like what are, what are you doing kind of strategy. <laughs> Uh, so, so that tends to be obviated in the in the Facebook uh, world, certainly, definitely in the Google world, and hopefully yeah. somewhat in the Amazon world as well. So, I think it, it's perhaps paradoxical that whatever happens, it seems to benefit at least the three top companies pretty clearly. Uh, I think see, where I independent think... ad tech can help. Uh, I think independent ad tech can have a. Uh, a good role to play here with being more supportive, more consultative, a better partner that's working with brands to solve different types of problems. And, and I think that's why there's still gonna be 
a need for independent ad tech beyond those three. I think, yeah, you're right that the, the net result is, is that almost anything that happens goes in their favor and they're definitely going to have a hit. But I think we're certainly going to see, um, you know, partners, you know, people relying more on their partners who can really help them in different mm -hmm. ways. So I, th I, I think, I don't think it kind of rules out everybody outside of those three. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think no. independent, independent yeah. ad tech is, should be more nimble, more able to do different things. Um, so uh, as long as we I, figure out payment terms immediately <laughs> then, yeah. and we survive through the summer. Um, yeah. so I think it's the last question we've got here, um, which is additional strategies that you're seeing in the next 30 to 60 days. Um, this sort of, um, is similar to the answer to the last question, except more reducing expenses, reducing expenses goes higher on these lists. Uh, I think probably reading into this, most folks still are waiting for a couple more pieces of information before they do anything you know, radical, turn off things, close offices, do whatever. But de certainly 30 to 60 day timeline is, is when those sort of things would have to happen. I think everybody's going to be, uh, you know, CFOs are going to be so busy for the next couple of months because they've yeah. got to go into every different government scheme that's possible in every different country. And we're seeing totally different levels of govern government support for individuals and for companies. Um, and then uh, that, that in turn then affects what different strategies you take on a cost cutting basis. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so much to think through there. Uh, you know, I think uh, there's, CFOs are not going to be going on holiday anytime soon. My head, of, my head of finance has been on maternity for the last three months and um, um, it's, <laughs> it's been difficult. <laughs> she's great. If she's listening, I'm like, hey, you're doing great. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, so this is the same question, just ad tech specific. I'm going to blow through this. Um, so, um, I think, oh, okay. Uh, last question. What could your vendors be doing better to help you? Um, yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm a vendor, so I'm, I'm reading this pretty carefully. Um, the flexible pricing, um, pause or restart billing, um, nothing. My vendors are fine. I, I want to meet those people. They must be beeswax customers. Super happy. Uh, <laughs> new product development. I love the one a couple down. Stop trying to sell me products right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also probably be like that one. <laughs> so um, <laughs> what would you do? Like, what would you ask your, it, let's say, uh, uh, I'll give it to Anna since you work with marketers the most. Like, would, would you try to renegotiate a contract right now? Would you go to your DMP and say, hey, we're not using it. We need some new terms. What, is now yes. a good time for that stuff? I yes. mean, yes, I, it, not, not, not is it a good time or a bad time, you have to, because if you're, uh, you know, if your CFO is mandating a 20% cut across the board, then you have to find, you know, the least painful ways to, to hit that number. And the last thing you want to do is your, so everything else comes first. And I think, you know, from, what I'm seeing in, in market and from our customers, again, putting a bit of a positive spin on it, it's really a great time to go and, and look at your stack and, and reevaluate it. So we do these, these uh, you know, stack evaluation projects all the time where you kind of look at what, what are all the different things that you've bought and acquired across different divisions, perhaps different territories, over the years and what their overlap is <laughs> and whether you need all of the above. And especially in some cases, if you have a blanket uh, contract with a really large provider like a marketing suite, there's probably you know, two or three things there that you've acquired over time that you're not only not using at all, but you're just not getting the ROI there. And mm -hmm. any, any kind of shaving off of a monthly or an annual fee will be welcome right now. So I, I think that's a really good starting point for a lot of marketers. The other area would be investing in things that are perhaps more on the content marketing side, more on the community building side, if that's mm -hmm. the, the kind of the, market, the, the marketer scenario. Because those will be perceived exactly as, okay, you're not trying to sell me something right now but you're still somehow participating in, in this conversation. And I think that's just a, a good use of, mm -hmm. of everyone's time and energy right now as well. Content like this webinar. For example. <laughs> For example. Dom, what are you doing to squeeze vendors, your vendors? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we're looking at every cost that we've got in the business and working out how we can be as efficient as possible, what's needed and what we can do. I mean, I think the companies are gonna go all the way down to 
not paying their rent. You know, I think that I think that it's going to be, you know, extreme measures everywhere as people already prepare for this. Um, mm -hmm. But what I really want from our vendors is actually kind of more a uh, more of a like an effort to really understand what are the areas of traction that we're really focusing on as a business. Like we're we're going to be consolidating a little bit our focus. You know, we're going to be focusing on areas where our clients need us the most, where we think we're going to get the most traction. And we need our vendors to really understand that and not put us in a list, uh, you know, put us in a, you know, a roadmap that just doesn't really care about that and say, oh, it's going to be ready in a year's time. That doesn't really help mm -hmm. us. And we're, we're going to end up working with the partners that really make our, the areas of focus that we've got as fluid as possible. Uh, we have no choice. There is no choice. Yeah. We've just got to make sure that we, we are, um, we are not, you know, we're not wasting our time on the, on the wrong areas. Yeah, and the um, counterpoint and the thing, is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say that our clients, what, what have our clients wanted from us? I think probably the one thing that we, we do as a business is um, uh, we provide a lot of insights. Um, so we've been completely overrun with, uh, with bespoke requests as um, clients try and understand what's happened, what, what consumers wanting since the, the, the COVID outbreak. It's only a couple of weeks old, really. Uh, so all the data that's in the market that everybody's using is really old and completely out of date and the wrong audiences and the wrong people. And what they're really looking for right now is a fresh look of what's going on in consumers' minds. So fresh data for us is, is seriously hot right now. Um, and we're going to see that being you know, used to help people just plan and understand their audiences and their strategies, separate even media buying. You know, people just need to have a window into it. Uh, and then we'll see the continued growth mm -hmm. of CTV and video, et cetera. The, the areas that are already hot and we'll see, uh, we'll see other medium, just other media like out of home, just kind of really contract down again. Um, so that's what I think yeah. is going to happen. No one's leaving their home. So out of home is trouble. Um, yeah. So we, we basically run through like everything that all the questions I was going to ask on our panel while we're going through the survey. And I know the Q and A has been very lively. Um, there's a chat window of 41 messages. So let's <laughs> open it up to questions and we'll, um, and we'll um, uh, give it to Paul to do the moderation. Yeah. Hey, all right, I'm back. So there have been a lot of questions coming in. Uh, we probably don't have time to answer them all, but if anybody would like to ask their question live, that'd be super cool. Uh, you know, we'd love to see your face in a weird room you're gonna be asking them in, but I won't wait for that. So, uh, so from Ben Kartzman, uh, Speaking of vendors, any read on what the core infrastructure folks like AWS will do for businesses light like ours? On one hand, we have long payment terms with clients. And on the other hand, we have infrastructure partners who demand payments more quickly. What to do? I wouldn't hold your breath on that. That's my general point of view. I mean, AWS, when you talk about discounts, they move in like tenths of a percentage uh, per year. Um, my, my guess is they would not be the place I'd look for uh, savings. Okay, so it looks like we have uh, three people who've raised their hands so far. I'm going to take a gamble and let one of you ask a question. Uh, so, so let's see, uh, Matthew Goldstein, I'm gonna promote you. Oh my God, Matt Goldstein. <laughs> All right, hi Matt, how you doing? Gotta unmute. Hello. I'm doing great. Awesome. Ari, right, you look really good. I, if I had a suit, I'd put on my suit. <laughs> yeah, if anyone wants to wears a suit, they get immediately promoted to do Q&A. <laughs> what, what do you got for the panelists, MSG? So here's my question. Uh, a lot of the brand advertisers, probably more TV, it feels like their messaging that they had previously was just totally inappropriate. Like you can't see an ad for someone walking around holding hands in a big crowd or something like that. And there's a couple ads I've seen like Burger King where I guess they reshot the ad and there's this woman holding with gloves two bags saying if you use my app you can actually come and you know we'll drop it off with limited touch and everything but it just feels like the creative process now especially everybody working from home it takes a while so until we get new creative i think you're going to see a slowdown especially on the tv side what do you guys think well you got to take into consideration how long the cadence for creative development in general is for most brands like there are very few very well brands that can iterate creative very, very rapidly and syndicate it. So Burger King comes to mind, uh, uh, Nike comes to mind, and they usually have a very different setup and relationship with their creative agency. So I, I think that there were a couple of examples of uh, car makers who've also kind of very rapidly- G GM's done a great job lately. 
exactly. So I, I think as as we are uh, approaching, I think this is week two officially for the U.S. So as we go into week three, week four, we'll start seeing more of that kind of work where people will will still want to be present, but not you know it's not going to be oh it's the whatever holidays next not President's Day, but whatever is next, sale, come to your dealership because you can't go to your dealership now or you should be going to your dealership. So we, we should be uh, seeing more creativity come out of the larger brands who still have the relationships with their creative agencies and the money to, to invest in these kinds of things. Yeah, and that gets exciting to be able to see that down the road. Yeah. So that was my question. Thank you. All right. Uh, we, we, I was going to say we just. I was going to say we we just actually saw a very big booking come in uh, last week. A uh, big campaign for KFC, who uh, managed to change mm -hmm. their creative pretty quickly, considering their slogan. Oh, they're excellent. They they've had some really really cool campaigns, especially in the UK. But I I really like what they've done very very quickly. That's a great example. Yeah, that's good. Very nice. All, All right. right. Thanks for Thank volunteering you, to be on video. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're going to be de demoted. You know, I was like, <laughs> sad. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. Um, Tom Jenin, you're up. Uh, go ahead. And by the way, none of this is rehearsed. I don't know, you know, who, we're, who's asking a question, but uh, you can feel, feel free to join. It's like a real, a real panel. You never know who's going to stand up. All right, Tom, what do you got for us? There we go. It's all happening now. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't have a suit. I'm not even sure I own a suit anymore. So um, we'll have to think about that. But actually, I think the way, obviously, there's a lot of ad tech uh, vendors on, on, the, on, the, on the line. But programmatic seems to be behaving differently than direct and IO business. Just seems like everyone is really seeing just massive bloodletting in IOs, which is certainly down on the sell side. Um, but when it comes to programmatic, that seems to be holding fairly steady. How does how do people think about that? Is that something that's going to is it's just the sh other shoe hasn't dropped yet, or is it something that we think is performance driven and probably going to stay steady? Well, we're definitely seeing prices go down, and uh, I think that's been the consensus of everyone who's looked at it so far. So volume is up and prices are down in programmatic, and so one benefit is that it can reach a different equilibrium and remain relatively stable because of its dynamic nature. Um, that's the only data point I've got. Well, prices might be going down because they're like, my IOs are in the toilet and I just need to get as much as I can. It's like well, the selling any also, barrels I can because the price went down. But there's also so much more new inventory because everybody's, you know, at home, everybody who can be is at home and, and consuming content as much as they can. So it's kind of the, the, the perfect storm of uh, folks backing out of, of uh, higher priced direct deals, uh, still thinking that they can get the same objectives programmatically, and uh, it, it being a relatively easy channel to divert spend to and to have relatively low commitments in most places. So I think that's why it's, it's appearing to be a little bit more uh, resilient, perhaps. I would look at the mix of who's buying what programmatically and would expect that uh, video content is, is showing very different pat patterns of behavior than uh, regular old display, for example. Yeah, I'm I think you'll probably also see a, a change from agencies to, to uh, direct marketers mm -hmm. because agencies agencies are going to need to spend the money as fast as possible when it comes back in. So you're probably going to see another wave of IOs coming back out, um, especially as it opens up some more you know, mid, mid and upper funnel stuff, more branding activity comes back. That's going to lead to more IOs. You can, you can kind of understand why programmatic always on stuff would, would continue through this period. Yeah, I think there's also another shoe to drop, which is deliveries are still happening. So e-commerce is, is relatively healthy. I mean, Amazon has said they're deprioritizing non-essential things. Um, but um, I think those e-commerce dollars will dry up if they can't actually sell anything for um, at some point. Um, so yeah, thanks, yeah, Tom. Exactly you're right, because yeah. that's another point is about the fulfillment side of things, isn't it? The supply mm -hmm. chain is going to be seriously hit, and that's going to have a, a longer term effect on different verticals throughout this year. Yeah, that's right. I mean, how bad is the emergency? Are trucks no longer delivering? Things like that are a little bit still unknown in the U.S. at least. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, and by the way, for future joiners, if you could just uh, introduce yourself um, 
and tell us what you do uh, before you ask your question. That'd be, that would help. So Matthew Roche, uh, if you'd like to join us and ask a question, that'd be great. Yes, am I on mute? Yes, you're, not, you're no longer right. on mute. Well no done. longer on mute, good. Don't worry, Ari, this is not a cookie question. Um, <laughs> I, I was believe just, you. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I was, I, was, I was wondering what, you, what, your, um, what your approach to a uh, time frame was. It, it feels like there's a period of time that we can go through this, which is more or less kind of safe for everyone. And then there's a period of time where shit's gonna really hit the, the fan. Is that like two months we're fine, six months we're 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 dead? What's your what, what, what are you planning for? Uh, the way I, uh, the way I think about it is like there we're in the period where the endemic advertisers are really affected, so uh, sports, travel, retail, um, and we are all weathering that. Um, but the question is, does the other shoe drop where there's a general economic recession and all across the board the advertising is cut? And then how long does that last? Those are all, those are the questions we're trying to narrow down how much we know. And the answers to those questions will determine, you know, how much we have to cut costs, how much, what our behaviors are, when we expect things to get back. And I feel like we still don't have enough information on those. Uh, maybe if some of the countries in Europe, like France and Italy, uh, that started having the crisis earlier, start rebounding earlier, we'll have more indication of what's ahead for the U.S. But right now, all we, the only model we have is China um, is not very applicable. Yeah. China, Japan, and to a lesser extent, South Korea, that are all kind of you know, either returned to business as usual or are rapidly returning to business as usual. And I, I think, uh, to your point, Ari, it's going to be very region-specific and country-specific in some cases. Uh, so we, it, it's a day, week, kind of thing here in the U.S., which is terribly helpful for our market we are. And uh, for many technology companies, we're by default the largest market. So any disruption in service in the U.S. has a really big ripple across the, the ecosystem. So I think our answer I don't know you for a little while longer. I think there's going to be a lot of concern around. Uh, there's going to be a lot of concern around the double dip here. You know, October, November, yeah. Q4, Q4's yeah. numbers, Q, Q4 spend is extremely questionable right now. Yes. So uh, uh, you know, th there's a good chance that. Th I mean, if you think about it, there's clearly going to be some sort of. Even if we're allowed to go back to work and everything kind of you know resumes for the summer, there's still going to be policies in place to protect social dis I mean there's certainly no way that these certain sectors are just not going to be continually hit despite a reception recession even just because of COVID still and then there's a very good chance of it coming back again and then there being another type of shutdown and another another tightening up happening again in October November so I, I really think this is a this is something that we've got to prepare for now because we're all optimistic about it jumping back and obviously there's a lot of opportunity out there there's a lot of brands out there that are going to keep spending there is a you know there's a very buoyant couple of sectors uh, but you know, even those are going to see. You know, even those may get tentative after time. So you say you're not booking the villa in October, then, are you? Unfortunately, <laughs> the villa. Uh, I'm not sure the villa party uh, all uh, standing around in our jumpers, uh, sweaters, and uh, drinking hot chocolate is going to work at the Captify pool party. I'm afraid we can. So uh, I think it's unlikely. All right. Thanks for your advice, right. guys. We have. It's really time surreal time. to be thinking about can right now, isn't it? <laughs> it's devastating. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. So we have only nine minutes left. So I, I will take one more hand hand raiser, um, and then I do want to leave time for a little bit of housekeeping, and then a couple of the questions that came in uh, from folks uh, that did, that don't prefer to go on camera. Um, and thanks everyone for your patience with all this. So we have uh, Ben Williams, and uh, Ben, if you could unmute and introduce yourself. I think I can unmute you for you. There you go, and let us know uh, which question is. Hey, um, Ben Williams. I'm from SAS. We make an ad server, amongst other things. Um, I'm interested in what sort of vendor discounts people are asking for, what time period they're covering. You know, what what are people what are people asking their vendors for, and what are vendors providing? And particularly, sort of like what kind of time frame are we looking at? <clears throat> Well, I mean, customers are going to ask for the world. So it's a, I think it's a question of, as a vendor, how do you understand their, their 
problems and try to do something that builds the relationship as opposed to, you know, ends it or, or just take a hit like, oh, you get free, free bidding for six months. That's not going to work for anybody. Uh, right. So, so I, I think w we actually haven't had, we've had customers come to us and say, you know, uh, we need some relief for a month or two months or until this crisis is over. And then I think a good vendor will listen to you and kind of get in the phone and try to figure out some way to, um, to give the customer the service they need, but at a, at a, some economics that makes sense for both sides. I don't know from a negotiating perspective is a better approach. I and mean, maybe you just go in, you know, guns blazing and say, I want to cancel, give my money back and then find some middle ground. So very adversarial relationship to have with your folks. And I, I think <laughs> that vendors have certainly earned that type of relationship and others not. I mean, like it, it's a really, really hard question to answer right now because both marketers are trying to understand what's we're, mission we're, critical for them versus. We're, we're kind of looking at giving people sort of three and six month options. Mm -hmm. uh, with discounts within those. So six months, you would get a smaller discount. Mm -hmm. Three months, you'd get a larger discount. And you're doing this proactively? Um, well, you are now on this. If you are. Here, with some <laughs> customers, <laughs> with some customers, we are. Um, As of a few minutes other, ago. Other customers have approached us, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, it's good to have those conversations if uh, for no other reason, just to kind of uh, understand what your customers are thinking of and where their heads are uh, with uh, with how they're thinking of using your technology but but I, I think the, the the cart before horse here is uh, you the marketers have to do their homework first and understand and map out like what are their core technologies versus what are the technologies that should be reevaluated right away and what are the ones that should be cut uh, immediately. So it, it, I think it'll depend on client by client. So I don't, I don't know that you can like send out a, here's a 20% off coupon kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> what, one option, Ben, is uh, if someone asks for, say, a two-month discount, uh, you, you can give it to them with a two-month extension to the contract. Mm -hmm. We're doing so, that as well. Yeah. 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 Or, or, or four-month extension. Or, right. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, Thanks. All right. Thanks, Ben. Um, Thank you. So uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we do get a question um, from the audience that's not uh, a live one, but a lo lot of questions about uh, blacklisting uh, content mm -hmm. that's related to COVID-19. So I'd love to hear the panel's reaction to, to that. I mean, the, for me, the, the short of this is if you're buying, if you're regularly advertising on news sites and you're proactively blocking the news, what are you doing? I think this is not a strategy. So I, that, <laughs> that kind of sums up my feelings about this. I agree with you. Like if you want, if you want sports coverage, buy the sports pages. Don't yeah. buy, don't buy the New York Times and block everything that's not sports. It's just, it's wasteful <laughs> and it's, it's disrespectful of the New York Times and especially by the homepage. I mean, a lot of this brouhaha started when I tweeted the picture of the homepage of the New York Times being blocked. And then someone did the same thing in the Wall Street Journal. And it turned into this giant boulder rolling downhill. It, it, but seriously, how much does that cost? What's the CPM on the homepage of the New York Times that you then block it? Makes no sense to me. Yeah, great. So uh, one last one last question from the audience. Will CTV be the big winner of 2020? <laughs> I, I think there will be few winners, maybe like smaller losers or or you know, who who lose the week is the way to think about it. Uh, I, I think definitely environments that are in your home and where you can somewhat guarantee brand safety are, are on the up and up. And if they are seeing an influx of, of more impressions, which they should be, that definitely is. And I think this crisis in general, we were talking about this earlier when Ari was mentioning in housing, is going to accelerate a lot of the, the trends that are present in the market already and are now just kind of going to go into overdrive. So that shift to CTV is, is one of them. Uh, there are several others as well, but we'd need a whole afternoon to unpack them. So I'll just leave it at that. I think, yes, that's definitely one of the potential beneficiaries of, of the current uh, situation. 
and it was it was already a beneficiary. It was going to win 2020, even if nothing happened. Um, yeah. Now with people with viewership up, that's great because there's always been a shortage of inventory. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, any final thoughts from the panel? We have three minutes and uh, a little bit of housekeeping to do. So keep it to 10 seconds each. Uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll go with uh, one thing we haven't mentioned is is this this era of work from home is very is, is a very odd one. I'm sure you guys have been grappling with it for the last week, trying to trying to get trying to get to grips with it. And there's there's a lot of moving parts. And I think the the one thing that we've got to do. I mean, we've obviously got to keep morale up, and everyone's got to over communicate. But I think this is really the time now where we all really have to trust, and we're really going to trust our managers and our people in our business more than ever before. And I think that's. Uh, that's one of the real positives that's going to come from it is that throughout this, we're going to end up better businesses, better communicators, better levels of trust. Uh, and I'm actually pretty excited about that. You're here. <laughs> Anna, do you have anything else to say or I'll close it up? No, I think we, we've uh, loved the discussion. I think we had a, a, we tackled just about everything we, we could in such a short time. I'm still flabbergasted. You're wearing a suit and a tie. I mean, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> it's for you. Um, uh, the uh, I'm going to give a un, unrequested plug, which I believe there's another webinar starting right now at one from Advertiser Perceptions. It's going to have an actually scientific basis survey of the pricing changes in the market. Um, so if you're our our survey was not scientific at all, interesting data points. But if um, if anyone wants to see kind of a better better take on what's going on uh, quantifiably advertiser perceptions has been pretty on top of it. Um, so I'm giving them an unpaid, uninterested plug. Um, but thank, I want to thank everyone for coming, especially our guests. It's been uh, a great conversation. I'll hand it back to Paul for the housekeeping. Yeah, thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, we had over 500 people join this and join that conversation. Thanks especially to those who joined on camera. This is a first for us. Uh, when you exit the, the, the Zoom, you'll be redirected to a survey. It's just three questions. We'd love to know what you think of all this and whether we can keep doing panels like this and whether they can replace the real thing. So thank you, everyone. I hope everyone stays safe, uh, stays healthy, and takes care of each other. Uh, have, have a great rest of your day.